Welcome to this video, which introduces the concepts behind AC steady state analysis. In this video, we'll first um, talk about AC steady state analysis for a bit, uh, try to explain why we use it, why we care, why it's such a useful thing, and then we'll finish with an example of analyzing the circuit that we have up here uh, using AC steady state analysis. So the idea behind AC steady state analysis is quite often we'll have a circuit that has only independent sources that are sinusoidal. So for example, the circuit we have on the screen has a voltage source that um, the source has a frequency, a radian frequency of 377. It's uh, 10 volts um, in amplitude. So basically you have a, a sinusoidal source that goes from plus 10 to minus 10 volts 60 times per second. We might want to know what the voltage across the capacitor is, what V sub C is. And um, there are many different ways of, of approaching this. If you want to know exactly what happens to V sub C uh, from the moment that you apply the source, then you actually need to do transient analysis which is uh, more complex than AC steady state analysis. You may not believe me by the time we're done here. Um, and that's actually uh, beyond the scope of this video. The idea behind steady state is that all of the transients have died down. So, uh, for example, if I uh, <coughs> take my circuit, turn on the, the sine wave or the cosine wave, uh, it'll take a while for things to settle down, but once they've settled down so that voltages and currents within the circuit are no longer changing amplitude or phase, then I have AC steady state. And it turns out that in a circuit, a linear circuit, that is when um, I have only resistors, inductors, capacitors, or op amps, or other linear components, if the independent source that is exciting the circuit is uh, sinusoidal with a given frequency. Every voltage and every current in the circuit at uh, a steady state will also be sinusoidal with the same frequency. The magnitude of the voltages and currents will be different and the phases of the voltages and currents with respect to the uh, source will be different. So. Um, we can, uh, under these conditions, we can solve for voltages and currents using techniques that we already know. So, for example, we can use a voltage divider or nodal analysis or, or so on. The thing that changes is that the values that we work with become complex, which introduces some interesting issues doing the computations, but conceptually it's not that hard. So um, let's talk a little bit about the terminology we use and what it means. So uh, one term that we use a lot is phaser. And I'll try to resist the temptation to make a joke uh, based on the old Star Trek uh, TV show. Um, the idea is that a phaser represents the amplitude and phase of a sinusoid. So if I have some sinusoid A cosine omega t plus theta, I can take the magnitude and the phase angle and just write it as A angle theta. And this now is a complex number, a uh, complex number with a magnitude A and an angle of theta. And this guy here is a phaser. Okay. And you can see that if I want to go from a time signal, this guy, um, cosine omega t plus theta, to a phaser, so this is time, this is phaser, that it's easy to do. The magnitude of the phaser is the amplitude of the sinusoid. The angle of the phaser is the phase angle of the sinusoid. Another term that we use 
is impedance. And in AC steady state analysis, impedance is the same, or performs the same role as resistance does in DC steady state analysis. The impedance of an element, so I might have a resistor, the impedance of an element in general is a complex number. For a resistor, the impedance is actually just the resistance. For a capacitor, the impedance is 1 over j omega c, okay, where this omega is the omega that's inside our sinusoid. We don't actually do the computations uh, the circuit analysis computations with omega, but it's implied everywhere that um, we're dealing with sinusoids of frequency omega. And finally, we have an inductor. And its impedance is J omega L. So this is a resistor with resistance R, capacitor with capacitance C, and inductor with inductance L. You can see that this is a number that has only a real part. This will be a number that has a complex part. And this will also be a number that has a complex part. And so once we've defined phasors, again, phasors apply to the independent sources and defined impedances which apply to the circuit elements. Then we can apply um, the circuit techniques that we already know, things like voltage dividers, current dividers, um, nodal analysis, mesh analysis. All of that stuff can be applied. The only thing that changes is that I'm now dealing with complex values. So that's a brief introduction to the concepts. Let's go to the steps associated with phasor or AC steady state analysis. Okay, so I've written these down. For our references we go. Step number one is to convert independent sources to phasors. Okay. So let's go back to our circuit that we're going to use in as, as an example. And the first thing we need to do is convert our independent source into a phasor. Now to do this, we notice first that the frequency, the radian frequency, is 377. So I'll write this up here because we'll need to know this later. Okay. Then um, the next thing I notice is I have an amplitude of 10 and a phase angle of 0. So in phasor notation, this source becomes 10 volts at an angle of 0 degrees. Okay, that was pretty easy, don't you think? So let's go back to our steps. Okay, so We'll mark this one as done. We've converted the impedance sources to phasor, or the independent sources to phasors. The next thing we want to do is convert the elements in the circuit to impedances. So I go back to my circuit. I have this element, this resistor. And so we typically denote impedances with a Z. So I'll call this impedance Z. R, and again the impedance of a resistor is just the resistance. Okay, that was easy. The next thing we need to do is find the impedance of the capacitor. Okay, so we'll denote it again as a Z, Z sub C, and our formula for the impedance of a capacitor is 1 over J omega C. So this is 1 over J 
omega in this case is 377. C is 1 microfarad, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 6th. And when you work this out, you get, where do I have that value written down? You get um, 2.65 k ohms. I'm going to write this first as a negative j in front of it. Okay, how do I get this? Well, the 2.65 k ohms is 1 over 377 times 10 to the negative 6. You just plug that into a calculator. Where do I get the negative j? Well, negative j is 1 over j. And um, you can work this out to see that this is true. I mean, if you multiply both sides of this equation by j, you'll get negative j squared is equal to 1, which by is pretty much the definition of j as the square root of negative 1. So what I have here is the capacitor has an impedance that has only an imaginary part, and the magnitude of that imaginary part is negative. Okay, I could also write this, oops, got a little messy there, as 2.65 at an angle of minus 90 degrees. I can do that because if I look at this, uh, 2.65k, oh, sorry, I left the k ohms off. Um, I can do this because um, uh, the negative j gives me a point down here, so the phase angle here is negative 90 degrees. Okay, so again, we've made it through step two. We have impedances now for both of the circuit elements. Okay. At this point, I think I'm actually going to end because we've got about uh, five or six more minutes of stuff to do, and uh, we are almost out of time. So this will be um, part one of a two-part video, and we'll see you for two part two.